Have you considered the overlap of physical security with the technology that we use every day and take for granted? It's a concern that I struggle with. I struggle to understand it. So when a longtime member with whom I correspond occasionally contacted me and reached out about leveraging internet technology to thwart known threats, she had my attention. Um, members, I'm honored in, to introduce to you Felicia King. Felicia, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your work? Uh, sure. Thank you for having me. I am Felicia King from Quality Plus Consulting. We also are branded as QPC Security because it's a, you know, security is mostly what we do. And I've been doing this for about 30 years. And I'm not siloed exclusively in security, but I do construction management and I'm a certified welder and was started, I started working on engines when I was 10 years old. So I'm a little different than most women. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know, our customers are, you know, I don't want people to think that the things I'm going to talk about are enterprise only. Because we've been in business for so long, a lot of our customers are like retired individuals or a retired uh, secretary or a retired librarian, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes young families. So a lot of the things that I talk about and that I recommend are scalable from a retired person's budget all the way up to things that do work for business as well. And I think that that kind of breadth and depth of consulting and having done the construction management and living with the solutions that we implement. And I, at this point in time, I've done, I mean, tens of thousands of projects. I mean, over the last 30 years, it's, it's like crazy how much we've done. Uh, and as part of that, you really get this opportunity to have the insight to see what those long-term implications are. So total cost of ownership is very important to me and the support about supportability model of something. And I think that all that's pertinent to our discussion today in terms of enabling people to be as self-sufficient and resilient on their own as they can be, while potentially they may still need to find an advisor in their life to help them. <laughs> well, and, and we'll make sure that we link to you because there may be people who simply want to go to the top and get the best and, and, and engage your services or ask you for recommendations to how to proceed. It really is um, kind of a challenge for us uh, who don't work in, in that world and, and maybe don't have the uh, the mind that you do that that attracts you to those kinds of the mechanical and then bringing in the communications. But one of the enjoyable things about knowing you, Felicia, is the emails that we have exchanged from time to time. And th this is going back probably 12, 13 years worth of, of knowing you remotely. So it's pretty cool to see you and to, to talk to you a little bit and, 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 and learn more about that. But our topics are always personal security. That's where we share a common ground, you and I. And you recently mentioned that you were, I, I believe I would use the word leveraging your cell service to extend your coverage, and you were doubling up with Wi-Fi for kind of a belts and suspenders approach to having the ability to make that call out for help, kind of an option that, that would give you more, more solutions if your home was invaded by organized crime and you were finding information that cell jammers were being used to keep intended victims from calling for help. Well, that's pretty alarming. Um, I think that many of us have already accepted John Farnham's axiom that we're on our own, and yet there's also that responsibility that says um, there's trouble here. We need to see if, if we can get the authorities on, on site. And so while it would be tempting to think that you probably meant cell service plus our home internet, you made me aware that it really wasn't that simple, and and that was that was good for me to be taught that. But I know that you've set up telecommunications for clients, like you just mentioned, and I'm wondering what solutions would be suitable for uh, middle class home clients, and why would having two phone systems matter? What would be the complexity of installing and maintaining that kind of redundancy? Can you kind of get us started thinking what yeah, you, you introduced me to? You'd be absolutely shocked at how. Uh, accessible and easy to do some of these things are. It comes from a paradigm though that says I'm not going to be buying something from Amazon. You know, I'm not going to be getting an Amazon Ring thing. Uh, I'm not going to be getting a, a Google Nest this, that, and the other, whatever. Okay, like please, for the love of everything, stay away from the spy grid technology. That is not helping you at all. So one of the things that I would challenge people to think about is 
please don't limit yourself to thinking about stuff that was engineered for the consumer residential market. And in fact, most of the time, if you're looking for things that, that are in that consumer residential market, you're going to find things that are really not in your best interest. So don't assume that just because something was engineered for the business world, that it's outside of your financial reach. Let's consider communication depth uh, I've been reading about, you know, cell phone jammers by criminals. Uh, Claude Werner did a report recently where he said from his observation, from all the news things that he's reading, the criminals are coming in packs of three. Well, this approach that now says that you can draw down on your assailant and hold them at gunpoint while you're calling the police for help to arrive. I don't know. Is that even going to work? You know, so I think yeah. we have to be very serious in asking how do we create depth of bench in terms of communications for us and our family? So let's kind of walk through that. Please. Use your cell phone by all means, right? Uh, let's say they come with a cell phone jammer that doesn't jam your wireless. All right, so let's say you've got your cell phone and you do have wireless. Now, through that wireless connectivity, can you communicate with... A, an intercom system, a PA system within your facility? What if you have a, a, an outbuilding? How are you communicating with the rest of your family? Do you have like a speaker in your house that you can send those communications to? How could you do that? Because trying to get a cell phone call to interface with something like an IP speaker to warn the rest of your family, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Let's just be real clear. You basically need your own phone system for that. And now people are like, <gasps> My own phone system, mm -hmm. that's too complicated. I can't do that. Okay. Yeah. And I would say, yes. well, maybe it's not that complicated. It's not as complicated as you think. Uh, there is a company called 3CX, uh, and you can get a hosted small phone system for free. I think it's a 4SC. SC means simultaneous call. Okay. Uh, there are also technology called uh, free PBX. There's a free PBX, and it is exactly what it says it is. It's a free PBX. <laughs> um, there's another one called Asterisk. And so different ones of these have different levels of technical sophistication and techno technical requirements. So 3CX, you can do a hosted 3CX phone system for free. I mean, they'll host it for you. You do have to plug in a VoIP service to that, but I can tell you that's probably in the realm of like 30 bucks a month. So very, very mm -hmm. cost effective to do that. The cool part is you can use that for a lot of things, including uh, you could have, I mean, if you had 10 family members, you could have all 10 family members have an extension on that phone system mm -hmm. and you're basically paying the $30 a month. I mean, it seems like some really good economies of scale there. There are advantages. Does that replace our landline, Felicia? You bet it does. And in fact, <laughs> okay. I've done exactly that for a large number of customers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, it does. <laughs> uh, and I really, though, like and prefer having a phone system that I don't need an Internet connection to run. So if the Internet connection is actually working, great. Then we have that level of functionality. But i got to tell you, if there's some bad dude in my facility someplace, I still want, if they are not using a wireless jammer, because wireless and cellular are two different things, let's be clear, and Bluetooth is also a different animal, and, you know, RF, you know, CB radio, <laughs> you know, UHF, VHF, this is all different animals. So you can't necessarily know, um, you can't come up with some sort of a bulletproof approach that says that I'm going to use this one type of communication and have no depth of bench in my approach. And, and I'm going to be able to still communicate. So reeling that back, and I'll get into CB radios and how you incorporate this. But with regards to the advantages of having your own phone system on site at your, whether you, let's say you have a house and an outbuilding, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like only that complicated. Maybe you have a house and a detached garage. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to, at a minimum, have a situation where you can communicate with the rest of your family. Now, you don't want them to have to pick up a line, right? You want intercom. You want broad broadcast. So in my worldview, I want to be able to hit a button or dial a code, and I'm now literally broadcasting a communication across the entire facility. If you had seven buildings, fine. It's going to be all seven buildings. 
you can do this. It's a matter of, I think when you first start out, you, you have to look at what are my risks that I'm trying to mitigate? Well, I want to be able to yes. communicate with my family no matter what. If I'm over here, I want to make sure that I've got a communication out to everybody wherever they are inside of the homestead or you get you get what I'm going at. So you define your problem first and then you say, how do I make sure that my plan for this allows me to scale with it? Please yes. don't boil the ocean when you're doing these things. I think a lot of times people get all stuck on the technical complexity of things and they try to boil the ocean. Please don't boil the ocean. Have a good plan get some good advice, formulate a good plan, but start with the first piece. And if that means the, f the first piece that you get is saying, okay, I'm first gonna get my phone system and then I'm gonna maybe get one speaker. Get that worked out. Once you understand how to do that, you can add as many speakers as you want. Um, you know, get, get one intercom. Once you get that figured out, add as many as you want, add them where you want. A lot of times I find these projects you can do uh, 100% uh, empowered. Here's what I mean by empowered. Mm -hmm. If you have the uh, plan, so if you have advisory on the plan and you have somebody that you can exchange ideas with and call and say, you know, I'm stuck on this point. Can you get me past this point? Or can you, I've put together this plan, uh, look at my plan and tell me where my plan has deficiencies so that the plan can get corrected before it gets executed. Because when a plan gets executed and it's wrong, that's where it gets expensive. But then the rest of it, a person can generally do themselves. You can run your own wiring. You can mount your own equipment. You can fiddle with the programming. There's a lot of things you can do on your own. So like I said, a lot of this is extremely uh, accessible from a financial and a technical perspective. So... I want to be able to use a cell phone. A lot of times you're going to find you don't have cell phone coverage. All right. Now you need to provide yes. an alternate level of coverage. Let's try wireless. Mm -hmm. But I mean your wireless. I don't mean your ISP's wireless. Right. We need to talk about that. Right. <laughs> and, and then what if you've got a situation, like I said, bad guys, you've, you've actually stopped the threat you don't want to leave the scene because maybe you don't have the ability to retreat safely anyways. You don't know who is outside. Uh, you maybe you're holding one of the criminals at gunpoint and you can't exactly walk away. But yet your cell phone isn't working and your wireless isn't working because some other criminal in the vicinity or whatever they brought with them is blocking that signal. So the question I would say, what's your plan at that point in time? And the plan I would go to is one where there's a Baofeng CB radio. Now, Baofeng makes these very super, super duper flexible CB radios. It's a handheld CB radio. You can get a really long, like a 24 or 30 inch whip on it. And I've covered, I've tested this uh, signal distance coverage with those extended antennas and I've gotten up to three miles. So, oh really? uh, yes, really. <laughs> you know? that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it has to do with hilly terrain and the various frequencies that you're using and all of that. But I would argue that CB radio is something that we all should be uh, investigating at least anyhow. I mean, you can get a Baofeng handheld radio for like 65 bucks and mm -hmm. You know, keep the thing charged up. Is it going to kill you to have three of those? Maybe you have one in your garage. You have, you know what I mean? Like, it's the same sort of thought process you would have with yourself of saying, where might I have put a landline phone when you had landline phones? Think about your CB radios the same way. So I, so far, have not found a scenario where the bad guys have technology that's so sophisticated that they're preventing your CB radio from functioning, especially if you're using something like a Baofeng that you can use on BHF and UHF and potentially other frequencies. Um, there is a, uh, if, we f if you follow up with me later on with this, I can send you the uh, URL link to a guy's website. He's, a, uh, he's an operator. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know what I mean? And uh, he, I do. 
<laughs> he has a, a whole website and he has classes that he does. So anybody that's actually interested in expanding their capabilities and learnings with just CB, uh, there is a curricular for that and they could go to his classes or you could just do self-study books as well. And there's a ton of information freely available on the internet. So I think all of that's extremely accessible as well. But that really gives you your kind of depth of bench of communications aspects. And let me insert that I think that there's an idea with the CB radio that, that you bring into it uh, that, that, that maybe we should be dealing with our uh, community. And maybe this is like a community watch thing. If, I, if I'm in a hilly terrain, maybe my neighbor up the hill, I've got line of sight. And maybe I should go say, Larry, we may have a problem. Things are getting rougher. I hear the gangs are working, you know, this part, <clears throat> this part of the state. Larry, maybe we should both share uh, CBs, would you be part of this with me? Now, not only have I engaged a friend uh, who we may be able to help each other out if we're starving, uh, but we've also got someone who could then make that 911 call because he's not being blocked. That's exactly correct, yes. And that's the kind of scenario thinking that I want everybody to engage in. <laughs> Right. It's Very this good. is about yes. strategic, proactive thinking, scenario thinking about what's my problems? How do I mitigate that risk? What happens if plan A doesn't work and you go to plan C? And I, I frankly think all of this is completely within the realm of of everybody who's a network member, because, of course, what is this adventure of learning the uh, legalities of using lethal force to defend one's life? It's a lot of technically complicated nuanced things so this technology is is no different so i think if, if somebody can go through that level in their life where they expend a certain amount of energy and they gain adeptness in their skill set around the legalities of lethal force they can do so on the technology side as well well and even around the application of that lethal force then into the legalities then into the prevention step which also is part of what we talked about because one of the um, conversations that, that we've shared has been also about video monitoring. And, and there I start thinking, um, not only are we perhaps recording a record, which gives us some grounds that you and I should talk about, but, but also perhaps we're doing some preventive things that say, I see a truck that I don't know coming in the coming in the driveway. Um, maybe I want all the kids to go to the safe room until I figure out what it is. And then we use your intercom uh, suggestion. But I'm wondering what's if we wanted imaging, possibly audio, possibly storage. Now we're getting into a whole into a whole nother realm where I know that you've really got some chops. And then we've got the concerns about uh, legally what what attaches to admissible. Uh, video, audio that we might want to use. Talk to us a little bit about how we might record, where we might want to record, um, and and the just the equipment and the storage, all the things that attach to that. And I'm just going to turn the floor over to you because this is your world, not mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So for uh, what I didn't mention before is I have been a surveillance expert for over 25 years, and I invented a school lockdown solution that is 100% on premise, no cloudy cloud, cloud, cloud. So it works just fine when the internet is down. <laughs> and this is part of the thought process that I think you have to have. Um, we've also invented security safety solutions for the manufacturing industry that are surveillance centric. So I have a lot of experience in this area. Surveillance has a deterrence effect. Just the fact that you have cameras has a deterrence effect. Now, you want to employ in an ideal world, right? We're talking about incremental improvements here. Strategically, it would be great if you could employ cameras that are obvious and cameras that are not obvious, right? Both. Um, right. If you can ensure that comp component of your product selection includes the ability to do IP audio, ooh, that's even more fun. So let's tie that into a story. Let's say you've yes. got a trespasser on the south side of your property and they are traversing northward. So in an ideal world, you would be receiving an alarm notification, something like that, that would indicate that this trespasser was picked up on the south side. And you need to be able to tell a story not only for yourself in near real-time diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Who's outside? Where are they? What are they doing? What is their intention? Where are they going? 
you need to not only tell that story in real time, preferably, but you also need to tell it post time. I think about the uh, Venezuelan gang stuff that has been coming up very popularly in the news, especially with regards to Colorado. Well, the thing that really just broke that wide open was the lady had camera footage of it. So now it's something she can share this video with the world. And now it becomes a real thing that's believable. It's not up for debate. The video can be authenticated. It's not going to be a deep fake. Oh, no, you made that up. No, uh uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, that story to me, video surveillance is something that speaks for itself. Mm. When you have your camera placements strategically placed such that they tell a story, they can tell law enforcement, they can tell the DA. Guy started over here, he meandered this way, he was over here this long, he went over this way, he futzed with that, he walked around here, he did that. Okay, it's telling a story, and that story is not up for debate. Okay, mm -hmm. so your video surveillance system needs to uh, not only be comprised of the right placement, the right camera selection, and preferably audio involved with that as well. Yes. Uh, it needs to have the right date stamps. This is really important. You cannot, mm. please, for the love of everything, do not <laughs> manually define the date and time on your devices. Have a system that does that for you. Now, there's something called NTP, which is Network Time Protocol, and almost every mm. system has it built in, right? So you just need mm. to make sure that you have that configured correctly. And mm. the head end or kind of the controller system of that would reach out to NIST. And it gets, hey, I'm talking to the atomic clock. What's the current time? And maybe yeah. it does that once a day. So that way, if you have that in place, you can be assured that the date timestamp that's on all of your digital video, because that's what we're talking about here, right? We're not talking about analog yeah. video. That that date timestamp would be, have good veracity and would be usable and irrefutable evidence in your yes. favor, reinforcing the story that you're telling about what happened. So it becomes... Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we all know from Massad's teaching that uh, witnesses are maybe not the greatest. There's, yeah. you know, human witnesses are uh, highly variable. <laughs> well, and they hear and see different things. It's filtered differently. Yeah. So the video surveillance, it becomes that thing that speaks on your behalf. And as long as the video surveillance has integrity, then it's going to be highly believable. You're not going to be dealing with specious allegations from a DA that's claiming that, you know, something was manufactured. Mm -hmm. uh, so I only use, you know, you asked about what sort of technology. Mm -hmm. I only use AXIS communications, so it's A-X-I-S. And AXIS yeah. is the largest and best manufacturer of surveillance equipment in the entire world that's actually capable of being secured, and I will say it that way. Um, I, you couldn't give me money to put a Hick Vision camera anywhere around. That is communist Chinese technology, and who knows what the heck it does. Now, I've done packet inspections and, on the behavior of Axis cameras. When I tell an Axis camera to not, ref, you know, not phone home to the mothership, it doesn't. When I tell it to only talk to my video surveillance system, it does. That's it. So it behaves like you want it to behave. It functions in accordance with real security configurations at the network layer, which I won't waste time on discussing. But suffice to say that it is a technology that has integrity and it functions in the way that it should. It doesn't do sneaky things behind your back like an Amazon Ring camera would do or some sort of a Google mm -hmm. Nest appliance or some other consumer grade baloney frankly because almost all the consumer grade baloney is all designed to run off of a cloud controller and it phones home to the mothership and it leaks data mm -hmm. and you have no ability to know what it's doing or to control it so i only want to use technology through which i can do a real counterparty risk assessment on mm -hmm. and my so best counterparty we... risk is mm -hmm. it doesn't talk to anybody other than what mm -hmm. i tell it to um, duration of sustainability of these things. I have had cameras that have lasted for 14 years, right? So please, please do not have conversations with me about, oh my gosh, the ca camera is so expensive. No. Garbage technology, well, garbage technology is expensive. 
good technology lasts a very long time and it's securable and it's actually going to be reliable and function. The last thing I want to have is a scenario where I've purchased a Hikvision camera and just when I needed that camera to work, it barfed or it malfunctioned or it was compromised or in some way it didn't fulfill its mission. Then whatever money I spent on it, plus my labor and supplies and everything else, I was just lighting money on fire at that point in time because the component failed. So I, I'm not saying ride the equipment until it dies. But I'm also not saying that you should look at something and say, oh, well, that has a five-year warranty, so I'm going to assume that it's going to die in five years. No, I'm saying um, use it until it dies. That's okay. But you should have at least a capital reserve account where you are planning appropriate life cycle asset management because this is now a key component of, of your infrastructure. And so you would tell it that you would be doing the setup where we kind of back to what you talked about, about perhaps bringing in a professional to, to get that just very basic setup going. Because I'm not right. even sure if I can buy access communications uh, equipment, uh, I, you know, where you, I would you, find that. How Can you, I buy it could. online? I don't it, know. And yeah, you if could. I got it. If I got it, would I be able to do those those settings that you just referenced? So maybe you were back that idea, that idea of who could do just the very basic setup that then I can spin that I can spin off from, and and now I'm empowered. Now my my initial investment has let me go farther. So uh, the other thing that's awesome about Access Communications is let's say you buy a camera, uh, you get a VMS. Uh, they give you Access Camera Station for free for one camera. Now, the other thing that's cool is, let's say now you have four cameras. An mm -hmm. Access Camera Station license is perpetual. You're not renting it. Ah, you're not mm -hmm. renting it. I mm -hmm. still have the ACS licensing that I had from 24 years ago. I obviously have more licenses now. But so this becomes part of the economic viability of it. You're just paying, if you have 25 cameras, you're going to have 25 perpetual licenses. And they're like, I don't know, 126 bucks. And like I said, that's a perpetual license. There's no subscription fee on that. So it's very, very economical from that perspective. In terms of where might you run the video management system, yes. just take a, pick a PC. Go buy a PC. Go buy a PC with a two terabyte hard drive in it. Install the software. Make it happen. You don't have to have any sort of specialty appliance for it. Is a little bit more complicated than that? Um, it can be. You know, when, when we do those implementations, there's a lot that goes into the engineering and spec on that. And then we can actually do full management of those systems in terms of securing them and ma maintaining them. Or we can do it as a collaborative relationship with somebody and say, hey, okay, you drive, but we'll advise you remotely. So we're pretty flexible that way. But if somebody wanted to do it on their own, they could just get that software, buy the perpetual licenses, install it on a PC, and wing it right? You can totally wing it. The key piece is to make sure that it's not phoning home to the internet. You know, it doesn't phone home to some mothership someplace. Um, the, I, I want to go back to marking. Okay. This is not necessarily going to be default on a lot of things. So when you're creating, when you're doing your configurations, you do want to ensure that your video feed has that marking. You want to have some sort of like a location identifier. And I just use camera names. Mm -hmm. And then you want a date. So you're going to have, you know, 2024 dash and then the rest of the date. But you also want time. And I mean time down to the second. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff is important. And that's typically called an overlay, right? So if you're thinking about what, okay. what do I call that? What do I look for that mm -hmm. in the help manual? Mm -hmm. The word is an overlay. And Thanks. you need to then be thoughtful to, well, generally this area has a darker background. So I'm going to make my overlay white text. Or you could say, ooh, mm -hmm. actually, generally, this area has a, uh, a lighter background. I'm going to use black text. Or you can do something that says, OK, white text on a black box. There's you know, a variety of ways to do it. I could use purple text if I wanted to. You know? <laughs> but that's the, you have to make sure that your stuff is readable. You have to be cognizant to the scene. What you might do for a camera who is directly facing eastward that's going to take the sun right in its face mm -hmm. that's something you need to be thoughtful to you don't want your camera to be blinded maybe you need yeah. a little sunshade for it so as you're picking out your cameras say oh maybe i need to have a camera there that has a sunshade 
Uh, certainly, if you're going to put something on the outside of your building, make sure it's outdoor rated, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I would encourage everybody to, to get always get an integrated IR illuminator, which is infrared. And this is what you need in order to do things at night. To me, yes. it's a, uh, there's usually only about a hundred dollar price difference between a camera that does does and does not have an IR illuminator. So my general rule of thumb is I'm always going to get a camera that has an, a built-in IR illuminator, unless for that particular location, I had a higher priority to have a built-in microphone. There absolutely are cameras that have built-in IR illuminators and a microphone, but sometimes you have to make a decision because of, you know, factors, right? Uh, on Axis's website, they do actually have a camera selector. Um, if you spend enough time with it, you'll probably do okay. It's... Uh, it's like picking out any other technology. There is a tad bit of experimentation to it, and you just have to be okay with that. So if you're going to start getting into this, don't buy 12 cameras at once. Please don't try to boil the ocean. Get, get one camera and then hook it up and go like, oh, I'm now understanding that when I mount a camera at this height and I tilt it this way and I do this and I do that, then this is how it affects my scene composition. Mm -hmm. There's no substitute for your own experiential engagement with these things. And with the systems that I advocate, you can just get one camera and you can start puny small and you have no loss of, of you know, anything going forward. Now at the point in time you wanna go gangbusters and get 26 cameras, you know, call me because I'll get you discounts, you know. <laughs> okay. Don't don't go out and buy 26 cameras piecemeal because you're not getting good discounts at that point in time. But I would imagine by that point in time that you get past four cameras, you'd have a lot more understanding from your own experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this is what it seems like when I when I mount the camera. This is the implication of do I tilt it down? Uh, mm -hmm. There are things like uh, I have a camera that I have on one side of a peak of a building, and it's what they call a 360 camera. It obviously doesn't see behind it, but it sees 100% of everything in front of it. Like, I can see the walls of the building that it's mounted all on yeah. all the way around. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what they call also a panoramic camera. And mm -hmm. sometimes it, and those have their positives and they have their negatives. And that's why I oftentimes we'll do um, a, it's like a, I call it a team approach. Different cameras, different purposes. There are mm -hmm. cameras that you can get that are super duper cool to put on like a peak mm -hmm. of an exterior building facing perhaps a driveway that have something mm -hmm. called um, object tracking in it. So they're much more sophisticated cameras. I'd say they're maybe about $1,000. So they're still mm -hmm. not horrendously, it's not like it's a $5,000 camera, right? It's like mm -hmm. a $1,000 mm -hmm. camera. But it has digital object tracking, and that's the phrase that you want to look for is digital object tracking. And you have to program it, and it'll be like, okay, here's a car. Now, when I see a car, what do I want to do? Ooh, I can tell you what I want to do. I want to zoom in on that thing, and I want to get the license plate on it. Yes. And I would also like to get a face shot of who is in that car. Mm -hmm. So you could do that with a, a two-camera combination, or you can do it with a more advanced camera. The two-camera combination is going to be one where you've got more of a dedicated license plate reader camera. And... Mm -hmm. um, I would really only put that in in a business because it's um, LPR, license plate recognition, is a whole other completely separate kind of non-personal security related topic. Uh, so And probably ho beyond what we need. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I also have, um, I have signs. You can get inexpensive signs, oh, yes. right? We go back to the deterrence mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you don't want to have is you don't want to just rely upon one completely visible camera and make it completely obvious to the bad guys that there's the yeah. one camera and if they go kill take it. a can of spray yeah. paint to it or kill it, then mm -hmm. your game is over. So have depth. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to mention also you were talking about where should this data be stored. All right. Sure. Let's talk about depth of that. I'm a little suspicious of things like I can't necessarily count on how... Uh, an investigative team is going to respond to a situation. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I am not left without evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, um, people may, you know, I'm not going to 
be getting into politics here, but they may recall what happened to Roger Stone. With Roger Stone, the FBI came in and they took his DVR. Mm -hmm. So that would have left him in a position where he had, he didn't have his video. So now in mm -hmm. that scenario that the investigative team came in and decided to seize the equipment mm -hmm. because they wanted, well, you know, we, we think this is pertinent evidence to the investigation. We're just mm -hmm. going to seize it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be in a situation where your defense team doesn't have the evidence? Well, right. personally, I don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> so I put SD cards or micro SD cards in each individual camera, and that's an yes. on-camera recording. And mm -hmm. then you can send that video also to your own video management server. Let's say that is in your building. Mm -hmm. You can also have that data replicate off-site. There's a variety of ways to do off-site replication, which I, I won't bore you on the details on that. But think about this, right? We were talking about scenario thinking, scenario planning. Mm -hmm. If I have the, po the option to have that video stored on the device itself, but also in a video management system, but also off-site, have I now increased my probability of having access to yes. that video or that event data? I have. Yes. Now, let's take it one step further. What if you had email notifications configured with snapshots? Ah, wow. so this is, this nice. is super cool. In the event that you're talking about, I'm, uh, I don't know, let's say you went to the doctor's office and you just want to find out uh, what's up, Jack, you know, what's going on. Now, if you're going to try and pull up like a mobile app on your mobile phone and access your video feeds at your house, uh, you've got some technical challenges with that. Number one, if you're going to allow access from the Internet to your video management system, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you got some security concerns that are, frankly, above your pay grade, <laughs> okay? Um, okay? That's kind of like my realm. So please, for the yes. love of everything, don't do that. Don't, do not make your video management server accessible to any external. Don't do that. Please Agreed. do not do that. Because then the, you know, the Chinese can get into it. The stalkers can get into it. Okay, so let's, let's just take that off the table. Um, one thing you can do that's very, very within budget that does not open that vulnerability is you could configure email notifications. So mm -hmm. again, bad guy, trespasser on the south side, triggers an mm -hmm. alarm. Mm -hmm. That alarm, your VMS can grab a snapshot of that and send it to you via an email. You could also have perhaps a shared mailbox with your family, let's say your spouse. And so yeah. all of those notifications, rather than duplicating the notifications, which of course you could do as well, you can have those email notifications mm -hmm. go to more than one person, but you can also mm -hmm. just send them to a particular mailbox. And I personally like that approach because that mailbox can effectively be an archive. You can put a retention policy mm -hmm. on that and say, I'm only going to keep like the last four months of those mm -hmm. snapshots and email notifications. And you're taking down the total cost of ownership of that by just using the technology with an automatic retention policy on a mailbox. Mm -hmm. So that's another way, very, very inexpensive way, you can create a trail of evidence that says this is what happened. Because, you know, bad guy goes to the east side, well, mm -hmm. you've got a snapshot of that. Bad guy goes to the north side, you've got a snapshot of that. Bad guy goes to the west side, you've got a snapshot of that. It all is about how you configure the triggering. Uh, pretty much every camera has motion sensors mm -hmm. in it. Like yes. it's not really a motion sensor the way that you might think of a standard motion sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more like pixel changes. Now this is a really important concept to understand. If you're doing, I want to have a trigger based upon a car is driving by, realize yes. that a car is a fairly sizable object. Mm -hmm. A car is going to change a lot of pixels at one point in time. Okay. Okay, now we've got a guy off in the distance, and he's this tall. <laughs> he's like two <laughs> millimeters tall on the, on the video, right? That's not many pixels. So as he gets closer to your house, he's now four inches tall. Mm -hmm. That's more pixels. Right. Be aware that motion in video surveillance is almost exclusively triggered based upon pixel changes. So the larger the object the longer the duration that it has changed, that is what triggers motion. And you will have to tune this. It's a yes. per camera tuning because the scene is different. 
It's different if you've, if you've pointed a camera at the entrance to your garage, that's a very different scenario than uh, the sidewalk in front of your home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, speaking of sidewalk and, and really a lot of other scenes that you might think of, you can create areas of focus if you want. So you could have a trigger zone being just the sidewalk. You could have the trigger zone being uh, just the wellhead. I had a client who was very concerned uh, potentially about people tampering with his well. And, mm. but yet didn't want, didn't want like an alarm for any time anybody was going through the driveway. Just wanted to see activity around the wellhead generate an alarm. That's something as simple as you open up your VMS, you draw a little box around the object that you want to monitor, and you say, I want to create a motion alarm for that. Mm -hmm. Not hard at all. Well, and that's useful because one of the complaints that people have had since time immemorial about, uh, about simple motion alarms is the deer set it off and the birds set it off and, and the spiders set it off, if I remember one funny episode. Right. Um, and, and now what you're doing is giving us this ability to say, well, I'm really just interested about this gateway. I'm really just interested about this portion of the driveway because there might be other activity. And, and now we can cut out a big amount of those not really alarms. But how are we moving the image or maybe the audio? How are we moving that from the camera um, to the notification, to the storage Okay, so uh, we'll get a little technical here. And oh. the camera, uh, when you're programming it and it has audio in it, you are requesting that it record the audio with the video. So they're matched, yes. they're not separate. It's literally just another channel on the same video feed. So there's, there's nothing fancy there. It's either you have audio or you don't. And when you have a, a download of the video file and it included audio, well, it's there. So that's no big deal yes. at all. It is literally live streamed from the camera to the VMS. Okay. Okay. So the camera doesn't do it and do a handoff. It's live stream. So it's going there to your VMS. And like I said, near real time, mm -hmm. you might have a few milliseconds of a delay, obviously. And these are things that you want to mess around with as you're getting familiar with any sort of delays in your system. Because you do want to know what the delay is between the time when person is at your door versus mm -hmm. when you hear the beep or something like that. I use a bit of a, uh, a depth of approach. I do have uh, driveway alarms mm -hmm. and there's uh, an underground one that you can bury that's like a magnetic alarm. It's, a ma it's basically a giant magnetic sensor. And of course it's gonna go off when a vehicle drives over it. Mm -hmm. And these things are near 100% reliable. So the trick to that is, well, you got to dig up your driveway and put it underneath it. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does it, it does transfect your driveway. But you also have to get a wire out there. And there's a variety of approaches to that. And if you want to talk about underground pipes, we can talk about that. So that's a super reliable thing that's a little bit more expensive. Inexpensive mm -hmm. is, um, I think it's... Oh, it's the same company that makes the uh, garage door openers. Um, oh. uh, Chamberlain, I think. Um, so hmm. there is definitely consumer grade tech out there that does use a radio frequency communication. It's not, it's not wireless the way that we typically think about wireless. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk wireless, people are thinking about wireless internet. Uh, yeah. these, these little Chamberlain units, they're just battery operated. And the thing that I like about them that's really cool is they have a hood. So uh, there's a lot of keeping out the false positives because of its okay. little hood. Mm -hmm. The other thing it has is it almost has like a little rectangular. It's, it's like a viewing box like this. Okay. Yeah. That's literally what it's like. It's like a little viewing box. It's like if you put binoculars on. So when you set this thing up. You tell it, you have to put it at the right height, you have to point it directly, and you're, you're basically telling it, I want you to only look at the stuff that's in this like little viewing box so you can tune that really good. I think when people have gotten driveway alarms, 
um, motion sensor driveway alarms where they're having a lot of false positives is because maybe they didn't do the right device selection. I think that little Chamberlain unit is like, I don't know, 60 or 80 bucks, something like that. We're talking about pretty wow. inexpensive stuff here. Now, the thing mm -hmm. I really like about that thing is, ooh, is it fast. I mean, it is a real-time beepification. So that can be super duper handy, right? This is, we're talking about depth of bench here. Something comes yeah. down your driveway, you would like to have a real time beep. Let me get mm -hmm. my attention going so that I know something is there. And then I can maybe pull up my video surveillance and take a look at what is there. Mm. And uh, you're gonna have some more delays in something that is not that kind of uh, an instantaneous beeping. So where you really want that notification about like real time, uh, like if, if somebody did some horrible swatting on me, you know how they make a false allegation, oh, there's a kidnapping inside of a building or something because they're trying to uh, get you to be, you know, whacked, then uh, they'll do that swatting thing. Well, I got to tell you, if like if the SWAT team rolls up at 2 a.m., I want the beeping to happen to let me know the SWAT team has rolled up at 2 a.m. so that I can right. pull up my video team and recognize what's going mm -hmm. on outside so I can respond to it appropriately. Appropriately, yes. Um, because otherwise I might be dead. So I got to tell you, if that thing goes off at 2 a.m., I'm waking up and I'm paying attention to what's going mm -hmm. on. So for people mm -hmm. that have had uh, too many false positives where they're like, oh, yes. it's the wildlife, whatever, mm -hmm. um, Consider the consider the risks. <laughs> I'm trying to mitigate the risk of me not having enough advance notice to dealing with something where life or death is at stake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe I need to then, if I'm having a lot of false positives, I need to spend some time tuning my detection yes. system. Yes. Rather than just get rid of the detection system, tune mm -hmm. your detection system. Play with it. Mess with it. Find mm -hmm. out how it's going to happen. I mean, that's going to be the case. I don't care what the detection system is that you get. It always requires tuning, which is why I think it's so important that people try to not outsource all of this. It really is important that it's no different than you learn how to do this yourself. You're not outsourcing that, are you? Right? Same thing, because only you are able to make an assessment about what your risk tolerances are. Uh, so the, the technical piece of it is basically the camera writes to the micro SD card and the VMS is pulling that video in real time. In terms of the off-site stuff, like I said, that can happen a variety of different ways and there are different technical prerequisites for that to happen. And really your, your depth of... Um, resiliency is a bit of an art form with regards to that. Like I might, if, if you came to me and said, you know, Felicia, our internet connection is, is not so good, but I would like to make sure that if somebody came into the facility and either destroyed or took my VMS, that I still have that video. Can we mitigate that risk? And I would say yes. And yes. we would probably get you a small affordable NAS and do uh, file writing to an SMB share on that NAS, and we would put that thing in a, I'm going to call it a non-obvious location. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, certainly, th this goes back to the old axiom, don't have your server with the backups right next to it. Right? So mm -hmm. if, you're, if your VMS, your video management server is in one place, let's have the, um, your resiliency video storage location elsewhere. And it doesn't necessarily mean... Mm -hmm. um, across an internet wire someplace, but someplace else in your building, maybe it's in your mm -hmm. outbuilding, maybe it's in your garage, whatever. I mean, getting the stuff there, it's just a one-time expense of running a cable. So don't be afraid about that either. Well, and, and like you said, we, we may turn to you or someone like you to, to get us started and, and really as a sounding board. Uh, but that type of advice, I mean, many of us have got locking cabinets somewhere, locking closets, locking doors, where, where, where it would make sense to secure those kinds of things, just, just as that fail-safe, just to make sure. Um, and so, you know, we, we know that a lot of people have turned strongly to video monitoring. You mentioned that we'd even possibly be making decisions as to when we'd want IR. Well, I don't know. I figure bad things happen at night. I probably want that, you know, most of the time. Um, when we'd want audio, would there be 
illustrations where you don't think that audio would be necessary? Why wouldn't I just source everything with audio? Well, I'm not going to put audio in a or a camera in a bedroom. This is where I draw the line. I'm not Please. putting it in a bathroom. <laughs> okay. We're going to draw the line there. Okay. <laughs> um, you, you have to draw the line someplace. And one of the things that I've done is I like the, again, that storytelling component. This is not just exterior surveillance, it's also inter interior surveillance. And do I want to have that, that audio embedded in the video that is the full recording of the altercation? Oh, yes, I do. Yes. What because if, matters. It, it, if I can instantaneously, through the providing of this evidence, gain myself a whole lot of proof it's no longer hearsay it's no longer what i said i said it's now i have this proof i can probably take that time to conflict resolution with regards to mm -hmm. am i going to be prosecuted or not i can take that time to that problem resolution down very quickly yes. and um, this is the worldview that I basically have about video surveillance is I feel like it's a uh, it's pretty all encompassing as long as you're mitigating the risk. And I'll brief that. It's a tool for you proactively. It's a tool for you on an ongoing awareness perspective. Sometimes you get a package and you're like, who the heck brought that package? OK, mm -hmm. well, gee, I kind of want to know who brought that package before you tear into it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so it's it's your own post event because something doesn't always have to be an incident. It's your own post event evaluation. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, who did my kids bring home with them? <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> oh, maybe it's sometimes maybe it's that. Uh, but then it's also this great piece of evidence for you in the event that you do need to prove that what you said happened is what actually happened. Right. So. Right. So the risk management piece of that is you don't want to lose your data. You don't want someone else to be able to alter your data. And you absolutely must deeply safeguard against inappropriate access to your video. Yes. And I deeply. think that that's one thing that turns people off. People say, and I think they're correct, that, that they simply won't go this route for, for fear of you know, for fear of someone from the outside getting into it. And and that would be probably my biggest argument for having someone like you do the initial and then let me spin out of it. But uh, there's a there's another aspect of this, especially if we're talking about pulling wire or uh, digging underneath the driveway or whatever it turns out to be. What about for people who don't own their homes? How How much of this do you think scales for people who are renters? Yes, yeah, so actually quite a lot of it. So one of the things that we do is we do property management for commercial property management organizations and like large mm -hmm. apartment complex uh, owners. Now, if I was a renter, one of the things that I might do is I might go to my landlord and say, uh, let me propose something. I am perhaps uh, fine to draw up my own plan and to fund the professional installation of what I need, okay? Um, I don't want to do something that uh, is tacky or doing some like, for example, if I was the landlord, what I don't want to see is somebody doing rogue stuff. I don't want to see surface mount garbage. I would much prefer the tenant come to me and say, hey, let's do some cost sharing here. Um, let's have your contractor landlord, your contractor, I need them to run these wires for me professionally in accordance with your standards through your walls. But yeah. this is where I would like them. And what mm -hmm. I agree, for example, is I agree that this amount of stuff I would leave in this mm -hmm. unit if I departed. So mm -hmm. there are ways to amicably, amicably come up with a plan that takes all of the concerns that a landlord has and it diminishes them and it takes those mm -hmm. concerns away and a lot of it is just respectful conversations mm -hmm. 
So you can have what you want. You just, you know, you just got to go at it. I think from have a plan, look like you are a planner and you're respecting the fact that it's their property. And, and, you know, don't go in there and say, well, um, I want you to fund the surveillance inside of my apartment. That's not an equitable sort of plan. So can can um, you imagine being the next tenant to move in (laughs) and say, Gee, I wonder how much of this I can use. Gee, I wonder what the person before me was doing. That that's an interesting thing to think about. A uh, person would hope it wouldn't be wasted. Um, how how universal right. is this kind of thinking becoming, Felicia? Is it is it pretty rare? I would say it is standard operating procedure now in any large uh, complex of apartments that especially anything that's like middle income or upper middle income, okay. um, video surveillance is kind of being a thing that, I, that a lot of tenants are just requesting and demanding. And okay. they, they are exceedingly sensitive to the assurances that that system operates completely independently with no phone home to the mothership, no mm-hmm. mechanism for the landlord to be able to spy on them. So in those yeah. cases, when we do those things, <laughs> it gets a little interesting and challenging because the type of the type of like flexibility for management that you can use in something where it's your own system in your own home, but what we have to do for a tenant in an apartment building is it's rather different. Um, there's some major challenges with that uh, because we can give them the system, but we can't as easily support them, nor can we as easily enable and empower them to be able to have secured remote access. Like, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, of course, I have a smartphone. Here it is. <laughs> and and I have a uh, secure tunnel effectively without getting too technical on it. I have a way that I can push a button on my phone and my phone will initiate a secure tunnel to my network, right? So we talked about mm-hmm. you don't want to enable remote access to your video surveillance system um, unless you can restrict that exclusively to your designated authorized access. Yeah. You know, truly imperative. So that can be done with something as simple as an appliance at your house that you own or that's managed for you. And then you have this little app on your phone and you press a button. It creates a secure tunnel. And because now you have this secure tunnel, it's almost like uh, you and I picking up cans and having a string between it, you know, and (laughs) to our ear and mouth, right? It's like the Mm -hmm. game of telephone. It's the only privy to those communications becomes the parties of that communication and that would enable you to say be at the dentist or uh, be at the ballpark and you are able to uh, investigate further through video recordings uh, what has transpired let's say you get an email notification that shows something and then you're like "Mm, okay that's interesting I got this email notification I got this little snapshot I want to drill into that we don't want to have to drive home to go do that yeah. But we also don't want anybody on the Internet to be able to get at your video surveillance mm-hmm. system. 